Hello and welcome to our video covering topics in section 7.2 and 7.3 of your textbook. In this video we will begin with talking about when you can diagonalize a matrix and how you can do it. And uh, just reading this makes me think like, hmm, this sounds like a self-help book or something. Uh, when you can diagonalize and how to do it. Uh, anyway, and uh, then we'll cover a few other theorems. So, okay, the overall arching goal of chapter 7 is we want to diagonalize a matrix. This was motivated in particular by uh, dynamical systems. And so what we are trying to do is we are trying to find an eigenbasis, which if you recall is a basis for your vector space consisting just of eigenvectors of your matrix. So you want to find an eigenbasis because if you can do that, then you can diagonalize your matrix. Okay, so what have we already seen? Well, we you cover the basics of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in our uh, first video and then also I had you all watch the three blue one brown video and in that we saw that the eigenvalues of an n by n matrix are the values lambda that make this determinant zero so the determinant of a minus lambda i n zero that was covered thoroughly in the video uh, and one thing I don't know if the video mentioned or not but um, this is called the characteristic equation of the matrix. And so you get, yeah, taking this determinant, you'll get some function and then setting that equal to zero. This is your characteristic equation. But okay, so we know that the eigenvalues are the solutions to this equation. And then to find the eigenvalues, you have to, yeah, solve this equation. Once you've solved this equation, then you want to find the eigenvectors and to find the eigenvectors that means solving this linear system. And what does it mean to solve the linear system? Well, that just means finding the kernel of a minus lambda n. Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's say our we have this matrix 0, negative 1, 4, 4. In fact, I think I assigned this as a pre-assignment problem, so maybe I'll blow through it. But uh, yeah, a minus lambda n. So basically, you're just subtracting lambdas from the diagonal. You want to compute the determinant of a minus lambda i n. Then uh, you do that. This is going to be, well, OK, yeah. I'm assuming you've already done this. You've simplified or you've uh, expanded out. and then factoring gets you lambda minus 2 squared equal to 0. And so the solution to the uh, value of lambda that solves this is going to be lambda equals 2. So lambda equals 2 uh, is our only eigenvalue for this matrix. And now, okay, we want to find the associated eigenvector. We have to plug in 2 for lambda, and then we have to see, all right, well, what vectors actually make this zero. And so you matricize, you find the kernel, and if you do that the kernel here is any constant t times the vector 2, 1. And so any vector in this span of 2, 1 is an eigenvector. Okay, so with this example in mind we're going to introduce some new terminology. First, the algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue, lambda, it's the number of times that lambda appears as the solution of the characteristic equation of A. So here, when we're saying, what do we mean by the number of times it appears as a solution? Well, I'm saying, all right, well, lambda minus two, kind of how many factors of lambda minus the eigenvalue uh, how many times does that appear? So here it's got we've got two factors and so the algebraic multiplicity here is two. Okay, the eigenspace of an eigenvalue lambda is just the kernel of this. So if you yeah, you have some eigenvalue lambda, its associated eigenspace is denoted capital E sub lambda which is the kernel of a minus lambda i n, which is just the set of vectors that are eigen, the eigenvectors associated with eigenvalue lambda. 
So this is a really important thing to keep in mind. Like, okay, you've got an eigenvalue, and now the collection of eigenvectors is vector space, and it's, we call it E sub lambda, and it's just the kernel of A minus I, lambda I n. Okay, so in this, the eigenspace is going to be the span of the vector two one. And then finally, we have the notion of the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue. And this is just the dimension of the eigenspace. So it's just dimension of this kernel. And so, well, we found the kernel. It's the span of 2, 1, and this has dimension 1. Um, well, <laughs> I guess I uh, jumped ahead a little bit because I was going to say, ah, so the geometric multiplicity is 1. Um, but the important part about discussing geometric multiplicity is that it tells you how many linearly independent eigenvectors there are for any eigenvalue. So the eigenspace is really important because it gives you the set of all eigenvectors with that eigenvalue. And then the geometric multiplicity is important because that's telling you how many linearly independent eigenvectors you have for each eigenvalue. And remember, we're trying to find a basis of eigenvectors. And so you can see why it's you know important to know how many linearly independent eigenvalue, eigenvectors you get per eigenvalue. OK. So let's do just one kind of recap example where we really hammer home the notions of eigenspace and geometric multiplicity. So. Let's go back to our old friend, orthogonal projection onto a plane in R3. So notice any vector in the plane will be an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1, since it's not getting moved at all. And any vector in the orthogonal complement will be an eigenvector with eigenvalue 0, since it's getting taken to the 0 vector under orthogonal projection. So we've got an image like this. And then we see, OK, so the eigenspace E1 is just this plane. It's the plane B. And since this plane is two-dimensional, the eigenvalue 1 has geometric multiplicity 2. Now, the eigenspace associated with the eigenvalue 0, that's going to be just the orthogonal complement of the plane. And since this is one-dimensional, the eigenvalue 0, we say, has geometric multiplicity 1. And now notice that the geometric multiplicities here add up to the dimension of the space. So we have two, we can find two linearly independent eigenvectors in, this, in the plane, and another, a third linearly independent eigenvector in the uh, orthogonal complement. And so we actually have an eigenbasis because the geometric multiplicities add up to the dimension of our space. And so we know that A is diagonalizable. I mean, we've seen that already, but this is an, kind of putting our new terminology to use to say some things we've already said. But OK, so when can we diagonalize? In the last video, we said, well, we can diagonalize if, it's, if our matrix is similar to a diagonal matrix. But here's something we can you know, practically work with and get our hands on. We can diagonalize a matrix if the geometric multiplicities of all the eigenvalues of the matrix add up to the dimension of the space. So if the geometric multiplicities all add up to n, then A is diagonalizable. And um, you might just be ready to accept this right now, but um, there is something you kind of have to prove here. And basically what we need to do is we need to show that if we have eigenvectors from different eigenspaces, then they're going to be linearly independent. So the I guess you might be worried. You say, oh, OK, well, I've got all these different eigenspaces, and the, eigen, the dimensions of all the eigenspaces add up to the whole space. But if, they're, if somehow you could have some overlap, or they were somehow you could create um, linearly dependent vectors out of vectors from other eigenspaces, then uh, all right, you wouldn't in fact know you had a diagonalizable matrix. Um, all right, so that's, you know, we're not going to have to worry about this once we prove that it's true, um, prove this is true. But uh, anyway, yeah, 
So our goal right now is to show that if you have eigenvectors from different eigenspaces, they're all going to be linearly independent. All right, proof. Suppose you have a basis of eigenvectors for each eigenspace of an n by n matrix A. So who knows how many eigenspaces we have and what the dimensions are, but okay, we've got some eigenspaces. We have a basis for each eigenspace. Now, let's put all of the vectors and all of the bases together. We'll create a list of eigen base, <laughs> eigen, eigenspace basis vectors. Okay, so you know what I mean, I hope. Okay, so we've got a list v1 to vs consisting of all the vectors in these bases. And now let's suppose for contradiction that there is a redundant vector here. Uh, we'll let v sub m be the first redundant vector in the list. So if since v m is by hypothesis redundant, then that means we can write it as a linear combination of all of the vectors that came before it. And now let's note for a second that there's got to be some vector in here with some non-zero coefficient ck where that vector is in a different eigenspace than this vector vm. So where its eigenvalue, associated eigenvalue, is not the eigenvalue of vm. And why is that true? Well, if all of these were in, had, all, had eigenvalues lambda m, then vm would be in the same eigenspace as all of these, but we chose our vectors to be basis vectors for the eigenspace. And so we know that vm is not linearly dependent on anything else in the basis. <laughs> um, this is what it is to be a basis is that you're not going to get vm to be linearly dependent with, uh, why am I having trouble with prepositions? It's late. And okay. uh, you get the point. There's going to be one of these vectors, at least, has to be in a different eigenspace. It has to have a different eigenvalue associated with it. Okay. And its coefficient has to be non-zero, like it's got to actually show up. All right, so here's the trick is uh, multiply both sides of this equation by a minus lambda m i n. So we're doing a minus the eigenvalue associated with vm. So okay, we get this, and then, okay, since vm is an eigenvector, this is going to be, when you apply a to it, you'll have lambda m vm, and then factor out the vm, and so the left side you get lambda m minus lambda m vm, and then on the right side, again, these are all eigenvectors, and so you'll have, once you factor out the coefficient and the v1, or the coefficient and the vector, you get lambda 1 minus lambda m c1 v1, plus all the way up to lambda k minus lambda m c k v k, all the way up to lambda m minus 1 minus lambda m c m minus 1 v m minus 1. And now let's notice a couple things. One, this bad boy is zero. Lambda m minus lambda m, that's going to get you zero. So this whole right hand side of the equation equals zero. But we, uh, as I was muddling through earlier, this lambda k minus lambda m is not going to be zero. And this c k is not going to be zero, which means we have this non-zero term here and all these other terms. So what are we going to do? Let's solve for vk. We can solve for vk by you know, taking all the other terms, moving over to the left hand side and dividing by lambda k minus lambda m c k. So let's do that. And so being able to do that means we are able to write vk as a linear combination of vectors that came of other vectors up to from v1 to vm minus 1. But this contradicts the fact that vm was supposed to be the first redundant vector in our list and vk came before it and it looks like oh vk was redundant. Um, and so in fact all right our hypothesis must have been wrong that there was any redundant vector in the first place. So okay. 
eigenvectors from different eigenspaces. They're linearly independent. And so if you have enough, if your geometric multiplicities, if they add up to n, then your matrix is diagonalizable. Okay, so this is, um, we'll see this again in sort of when we uh, recap our grand strategy. But all right, so when can't we diagonalize? So one, if the geometric multiplicities of the eigenvalues don't all add up to n, then all right, a is not diagonalizable. The idea is that, okay, you just don't have enough eigenvectors to form a basis. But also, and this is going to be uh, definitely quicker to check, is um, if the algebraic multiplicities of all the eigenvalues don't add up to n, then a is not diagonalizable. Um, and again, you might just be uh, happy to accept this, but we do kind of, there's something we need to show. We need to show that the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue is always less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity. And um, yeah, you might have just been tacitly assuming this, but let's in fact prove it. So, okay, we are going to yeah need a couple of theorems to do this. So first is theorem 7.3.5. This is two parts of it. It says, if A and B are similar matrices, then they have the same eigenvalues with the same algebraic and geometric multiplicities, but the uh, they won't necessarily have the same eigenvectors. Just because they have the same eigenvalues, they don't have this, in general, they won't have the same eigenvectors. Um, I think we saw that in the 7.1 video, but okay. So handy uh, theorem about similar matrices and eigenvalues and stuff. So, all right, let's prove it. Uh, so if A and B are similar, then B can be written as S inverse AS. And so now let's calculate the characteristic equation. Well, to start doing that, we have to take determinant of B minus lambda I N. And since B is similar to A, we can write this as the determinant of S inverse AS minus lambda I N. And then the trick is to notice, oh, the identity matrix. Well, since S inverse or S is invertible, we can just write the identity matrix. Uh, that's equal to S inverse times the identity times S. Like multiply all this out, you get the identity matrix back. All right, so that's nice. And then you're all right, you're, because matrix multiplication is linear, we pull out the, we can factor out the S's and we have, or the S inverses and the S's. And so we get that the determinant of B minus lambda I N is equal to the determinant of S inverse A minus lambda I N S. All right, and since determinants are multiplicative, then we can dis basically distribute the determinant across the terms. And then if you recall, the determinant of A and the inverse of a matrix is just one over the determinant of the matrix. So these are going to cancel and we are left with the determinant of A minus lambda I N. And so the characteristic equations for A and B are going to be the same if A and B are similar. And since they have the same characteristic equations, they're going to have the same eigenvalues and the same algebraic multiplicities. Now let's notice one thing that we kind of proved along the way is actually not only if a if b is similar to a then also b minus lambda i n is similar to a minus lambda i n like we just these were just all manipulations within the determinant not depending on anything about the determinant okay so now since similar matrices have the same rank and in particular, the same nullity, I actually think I gave you these as homework problems, then the dimension of the kernel of B minus lambda I N is the dimension of the kernel of A minus lambda I N, which means these uh, two matrices, um, their eigenvalues have the same geometric multiplicity as well. Okay, and then I think all right, this is the theorem we wanted to prove uh, to get our quick check for seeing if something's not diagonalizable. Is, um, let's now prove that if we have an eigenvalue of a square matrix, then the geometric multiplicity is less than or equal 
to the algebraic multiplicity. Okay, so let's remember geometric multiplicity. This is telling you how many linearly independent eigenvectors there are for that eigenvalue. And so, all right, say you've got some eigenvalue lambda zero and that that eigenvalue has geometric multiplicity m. Okay, so we'll let v1 to vm be a basis for the eigenspace and we'll let vm plus one to vn be a basis for the orthogonal complement of that eigenspace. Then with this basis, we see that A is similar to a matrix B that has the following form. Okay, so this looks uh, somewhat complicated, but this is just if you, you know, your V1 in this basis is going to be, you know, one and zeros. And so the, uh, and since it's an eigenvector, it's going to be taken to lambda of itself. And so the first column is going to be lambda zero, uh, and then one's everywhere, or sorry, zero's everywhere else. Uh, yes, and so these first vm vectors are going to correspond to these first m columns. And then the uh, last vectors are going to yeah, correspond to these last columns. And yeah, so now we say, so A and B are definitely similar matrices. Uh, and we don't really care what's going on here. And, but notice, all right, let's calculate the determinant of B minus lambda I N. So if we B, if we like subtract lambda my, <laughs> lambda I N, we're going to get uh, lambda zero minus lambda, lambda zero minus lambda, all on these diagonals. And then, uh, you know, minus lambda is on these diagonals too. But now let's calculate the determinant. Well, okay, you want to, let's like do Laplace expansion. Calculating this determinant, we'll have a lambda zero minus lambda times the determinant, uh, well, I guess times this whole determinant here. And then, well, what's the determinant, this whole determinant? Well, okay, you take this lambda zero minus lambda and uh, find the multiply it by the determinant of this matrix and you kind of keep going down and keep going down and keep going down and you'll get m copies of lambda zero minus lambda times the determinant of this which is okay if you like break this up into blocks like this it'll be uh, the determinant of q minus lambda i n and uh and then, okay, yeah, you'll also, you know, if you're like expanding down each column, well, you have all these zeros, so you can ignore all those other terms up to here. And so you really do get that the determinant of B minus lambda I N is lambda zero minus lambda to the M times this determinant here. Um, but we don't really care about what's happening in this determinant here, because all we care about is the algebraic multiplicity versus the geometric multiplicity. And so we've said, all right, well, the geometric multiplicity is M and here we've just shown that, all right, well, the algebraic multiplicity has to be at least M too. Um, but since A and B are similar, then if the algebraic multipli their characteristic equations are the same. And so if the algebraic multiplicity is M for B, then it's got to be M for A as well. So there we go. If we knew the, if we know the geometric multiplicity, we can kind of you know just show by hand that all right the algebraic multiplicity has to also be at least m so this justifies this claim if the algebraic multiplicities don't add up to the dimension then a is not diagonalizable and the idea is well if the algebraic multiplicities are greater than or equal to the geometric multiplicities multiplicities then if the algebraic multiplicities don't add up to n there's no hope for the geometric multiplicities to do so Okay, so here to kind of wrap up this part, we've got, a, this is our grand strategy for diagonalization. Um, I definitely recommend studying this you know, after the video. Uh, but okay, you want to diagonalize a matrix? First, you got to find the eigenvalues. How do you do that? You solve the characteristic equation. Now, for each eigenvalue, once you've got that, you 
find a basis for the eigenspace. Namely, you find the kernel and you find a basis for the kernel of this matrix. And then matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if the dimension of the eigenspaces add up to n. So you gotta do this, you gotta like find the basis for every single eigenvalue. Um, and if the dimensions of all these kernels adds up to n, A is diagonalizable. In this case, we'll make a basis out of all those eigen, <laughs> the bases of all the eigenspaces. Um, and then like this word concatenating, this is just a fancy word for smooshing all these basis vectors together into one list. Uh, and then by some chapter three justifications, um, we can say that A is diagonalizable to B, or B has this form, and S is the, uh, the columns of S are the basis vectors. Okay, so like I said, like, um, spend some time with this one for sure. Okay, uh, sadly we're not done. We just have a few other theorems to wrap up and before we call it a day. So one is this notion of the characteristic polynomial. And so uh, like your book, we'll start with this challenge, find the characteristic equation for an arbitrary two by two matrix A. Well, all right. Easy peasy, we uh, we can do this. It's just the determinant of a minus lambda i, which means you're subtracting lambda from the diagonals. And now this is a two by two matrix. No problem taking that determinant. And if you wanted to like expand everything out, this will be lambda squared minus a plus d lambda plus a d minus b c equals zero. So that's the characteristic equation for an arbitrary two by two matrix. And the thing to notice at this point is that this characteristic equation, equation, well actually the left-hand side is a polynomial. It's a degree two polynomial. Let's see what happens if we have a three by three matrix. What's the characteristic equation look like? In particular, is this determinant also a polynomial? Maybe a polynomial of degree three. So let's see. So this determinant is the determinant of A with lambda subtracted from the diagonals. And then, okay, the yearbook claims that this determinant is gonna be A11 minus lambda times A22 minus lambda times A33 minus lambda plus some polynomial of degree less than or equal to one. So let's convince ourselves that this is true. Uh, all right, Laplace expansion, we've got A11 minus lambda times the determinant of this matrix, but the determinant of that matrix is a22 minus lambda times a33 minus lambda minus a23, a32. And so we have a11 minus, or a11 minus lambda times a22 minus lambda, a33 minus lambda, and then minus a minus one lambda times a32, a23. So that first uh, string of, terms multiplied together, I said, that's this. And then a11 minus lambda times a22, a32, that's going to be a polynomial of degree one in lambda. And then, okay, so now let's go down the column. Now we are going to have a term that's a22 times the determinant of a11, a13, a32, a33 minus lambda. But this determinant, okay, you take the, um, you know, cross and subtract. Uh, yeah, that's still going to be a polynomial of degree one. Similarly, uh, when we do the last uh, term in the column, A31 times the matrix you get here. Again, the determinant of this matrix is going to be a polynomial of degree one, and it's multiplied by a constant. So yeah, all right, I believe your book that the determinant is going to be a11 minus lambda a22 minus lambda a33 minus lambda plus some polynomial of degree one. And then if you expand this out, you'll get, uh, you'll pull out a minus lambda cubed. And if you see what the term on the x squared term is, it'll be a11 plus a22 plus a33. And then you'll have a, uh, a degree one term and then a constant term. So, okay. 
uh, yeah, looks like your book was right that, um, or <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, your book was right, but also our guess was right that we were going to end up with another degree three polynomial or with a degree three polynomial. So this is going to hold true in general that these determinants are going to be polynomials in lambda. In fact, it's going to be, you know, if you have a sub n or a is an n by n matrix, then the determinant a minus lambda i is going to be an n degree polynomial. Uh, two other things to notice while we're here, and you may have noticed this already, that, oh, that's definitely the determinant of a. The constant term is the determinant of a. Uh, that's interesting. If you uh, take up the extra credit challenge that I have in your pre-assignment, you will see that uh, the in the 3 by 3 matrix also, the constant term is going to be the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix A. And um, to see why that's true without uh, going through the horror of actually computing all this is to say, well, okay, if you have a polynomial, how do you get the constant term? You plug in zero for your variable and that'll kill everything except the constant term. But what happens if we plug in zero for lambda up here? Well, then we just have our matrix. So yeah, if we plug in zero for lambda here, we have the determinant of A and we plug in zero for lambda here, we get the constant term. So the constant term has to be the determinant of A. So, okay, that's no accident. Um, the other thing that you maybe not would not have noticed if I hadn't pointed it out is that uh, the term on the like degree down of your polynomial, this is the sum of the diagonal entries of A, so A and D. And that's the same here too. The go one degree down, and the n minus one degree has coefficient a11, a22, a33. Again, the sum of the diagonal terms. And uh, this happens often enough. We see the sum of the diagonal terms often enough that it's given its own name. And this is called the trace of the matrix A. Um, and if I'm being honest, this probably didn't need a exclamation mark there, but um, you know, I just didn't want it to feel left out. Uh, anyway, putting this all together, we have this theorem and says if A is an n by n matrix, then the determinant of A minus lambda i n is a polynomial of degree n, and indeed it has this form minus lambda to the n plus the trace of A times the all right, minus lambda to the n minus first term plus all right, some garbage and then all the way down to the determinant of A, which is going to be the constant term. And this is called the characteristic polynomial of A. So if you set this equal to zero, it's the characteristic equation, but this by itself is the characteristic polynomial. And um, like justifying why the trace always shows up here, um, we didn't really, I didn't, I guess, talk about it too much, but um, if you go back and like think about the Laplace expan expansion and how you would like go about getting this n minus first term, uh, Hopefully it would be clear, but um, you know, I had the opportunity to talk about it and uh, I forgot to. Uh, hashtag no regrets. Let's move on. Okay, so let's recall that similar matrices have the same characteristic equation and so they're going to have the same characteristic polynomial. And one kind of surprising consequence of this is that this means similar matrices have to have the same trace. Because look, if they have the same characteristic polynomial then they've got to have the same coefficient on the n minus one term. And so that means that the trace of A has to equal the trace of B. And um, yeah, you know, I still find this surprising. Um, yeah, just didn't see it coming because, I mean, matrix A, uh, sure they're similar, but their entries can look so different. And yet uh, somehow, yeah, their similarity is like captured in the sum of the diagonal entries. I don't know, seems crazy to me, but I believe it. Um, so yeah, this is a theorem called out in your book. If you have a matrix with these eigenvalues uh, listed with their algebraic multiplicities and they all add up to um, n, the dimension, um, basically if your matrix is diagonalizable, then the trace of the matrix is going to be the sum of the eigenvalues. And that's because it's diagonalizable to a diagonal matrix where the eigenvalues are the diagonal entries 
And since their trace, the trace of A is the same as the trace of its diagonalized matrix, the trace of A has to be the sum of these has some of its eigenvalues. So yeah, that's interesting and yeah, really surprising, I would say. Uh, and then one last thing is that the determinant of A is going to have to be the product of its eigenvalues if it's determ if it is diagonalizable. And this comes from the fact that, okay, well, if A and B are similar, they have the same determinant. Again, B is going to be a diagonal matrix with diagonal entries, the eigenvalues. And so the determinant of A is going to be, has to be the same as the determinant of B, which is just going to be the product of the eigenvalues. Okay, cool stuff. See you, you know, some other time.